Section 14.5, Temperature and Rate. The hotter something is, the faster the reaction will happen. This is primarily due to the fact that the faster th something is moving, all of the molecules are moving faster. Those molecules then slam into each other more, f more readily, and as they do that, some of them will react. So the, the more you can get them to bump into each other, the more likely you are to have a reaction. So the higher the temperature, the higher the, uh, your K is. So if you remember that this is your rate constant, K is your rate constant, the higher that this number is, the more likely that it is to go to products. So if you, if you have a very small rate constant, you're going to have mostly reactants in the jug. If you have a very high rate constant, then you're going to get more and more and more products. So the higher the rate constant, uh, the more products you're making, and the faster that it's happening based upon temperature. So, so there's a graph here of temperature versus the, the rate constant, and as the temperature climbs, the rate constant also gets hotter and hotter and hotter, so, which means that, like in the, in the picture, you've got a glow stick and some hot water and a glow stick and some ice water. Well, the glow stick is going to be brighter because that glow stick is actually a chemical reaction between two chemicals and the, pr and the product is light. So light's actually being produced as one of the products. So the light is brighter and not just brighter, but also uh, the glow stick will die faster because it's actually the chemical reaction is occurring at a faster rate. So if you remember the collision model, you're going to have to break bonds of the reactants and then new bonds are going to have to be formed to make the products. Well, you're going to have to some, do something to the bonds of those reactants to break them. Even if you pull two Legos apart, you're going to have to put energy to pull those two Legos apart, then be able to put new Legos together in whatever combination you want. So molecules can only... Uh, can only react if they collide together. So you're going to have to somehow break bonds and then those new bonds are going to have to for, react with, with something new. So usually what's going to happen is you'll have some kind of a, some kind of a reactant. Let's say this is a bond of a reactant and it's going to be struck with another molecule. Another molecule is going to come in here very, very hard and very fast. So in the meantime, what's going to happen right upon the strike, these two guys are going to be very close together and lots of energy because this was moving very fast. The kinetic energy, so it had a high kinetic energy. Remember, kinetic energy is energy due to speed or motion. That energy then, as it slams in, okay, okay, slams in to the, to the new molecule, the energy is enough sometimes to actually break that bond. And then new bonds can form and you can end up with two new products, okay? And that's kind of the idea behind the collision model. Now the energy required, the energy required to slam together with enough force to actually break the old bonds and form the new bonds is called the activation energy. We're gonna look at that in a second. The other thing required, not just the energy required, but the orientation is required. Okay, so let's look one more second at activation energy. If you don't have enough energy to break the old bonds and form the new bonds, then those two are just going to bump off of each other just like pool balls. One ball slams into the other, it just kind of bumps, and then the other ball kind of bumps away. It will only require, it will only happen as a reaction if that strike has enough energy to break the old bonds and form the new bonds at the same time. So not every, not every collision is going to have enough energy. In fact, most collisions don't have enough energy. Almost every time it strikes, you think, wow, it's finally going to strike, it's going to strike, and then nothing happens. It has to strike a lot in order to, uh, to form a reaction. Sometimes, um, if it struck right away, you would have instantaneous reactions. But most things don't happen at room temperature. You have to give it a little bit of heat. The heat will make the molecules bump into each other more frequently, 
with enough energy to slam in and actually cause a reaction. So the activation energy is one thing. So it needs the energy to do it. The other one is orientation. Remember, orientation is direction. So if these two things are going together, okay, then I think I can probably get a product. But if you if these two things are coming together, okay, do you see that it's not going to form in the right area? It's not going to form in the right place in order to make a um, a reaction. So it has to be in the right orientation where the molecules that are going to form the new stuff are actually banging into each other. Not just somewhere in the molecule, but at that place in the molecule. I really like this picture. The activation energy is the energy you have to put into something in order to make it happen. So if, if the, the putt-putt girl is going to get the ball um, over the hill, well, to get to, the, get to the hole, she has to put it over the hill. That means she's going to have to hit the ball with enough energy to get it not just to the top of the hill, but over top of the hill. So there has to be a certain amount of energy required. Otherwise, there's no way it's going to get to the hole. So if she has insufficient energy, the ball will just go kind of almost to the top of the hill and then roll back down. She has to do it again. So an activation energy is required for any reactant, uh, uh, to, I'm sorry, any reactants to come together to form a product. Okay, picture's worth a thousand words. If this is the amount of energy that the reactants have, okay, and this is the amount of energy that the products have, well, you can kind of look and go, oh, well, I'm going to let some energy out. So I've got less energy at the end. That means that I'm going to have energy go out, and it's going to be an exothermic reaction. I'm going to release some heat. Well, that's cool, but if the, ener if the energy started straight to here to here, well, then, yeah, that's going to happen uh, very readily. But if you have something like this to where I'm actually going to have to put a little bit of energy in and then get a lot of energy out... Well, I still have to put the energy in. If I don't have the energy, I can't get the reaction, even though it seems like it's free energy. There's energy going to be released. That means, you know, I get money back, but I don't get any money back if I can't do the reaction. I can't get any energy back unless I do the reaction. So I'm going to have to have a little bit of energy to start with. Otherwise, the reaction's never going to happen. So um, if... If I need to drive to the post office to get my lottery check for $10 billion, but I don't have enough gas to get to the post office, I'm never going to get my money. That is such a sad story. It's the same idea. I have to put activate, I have to put a certain amount of energy in, and then if I can get to here, then I can get all of this energy for free. That is a coordinate diagram. Now look at these pictures along the sides. What's happening is the energy that I put into it here is starting to bend the molecules a little bit. The bend the molecules, contort the molecules, tear the molecules apart. And then, once I get to here, the new molecules are sticking together, and that's kind of free. Okay, So the hard part is to pull them apart. And then, if once I pull them apart, they can just kind of attract by themselves. Let's imagine that these two guys here have some kind of a pull, some kind of an attraction, because they do. They're... They're sharing a bond. They're pulling on each other very hard. Well, if let's imagine those are magnetic marbles. Okay, I have to pull these apart. I have to add energy to pull them apart. Once they're apart, they can attract with the, with the new guy pretty easily. That's not a problem because marbles, uh, you know, magnets attach to other magnets. But I have to put enough energy to break them apart to start with. That's the activation energy. And activation energy is E sub A activation. All right, so in your concept, if I'm pulling away two molecules of reactant and then joining two new uh, bonds of product, there is a monster that kind of lives in the middle that no one ever sees that's kind of a half and half, okay? So it's these bonds are being broken. These new bonds are being made at the same time. This is called an activation or a transition complex place, or an activated complex. So it's complex, meaning that it's more than one thing. It's not just reactant. It's not just product. It's kind of a it's kind of a Frankenstein between the product and the and the reactant. The reactant is 
breaking at the same split second that the product is being made. And that is happening right here at the transition state. At the transition state, uh, anything past the transition state, will, these will break apart or break apart in whatever way that you're looking at. And the new products will be formed and the old ones will be broken away. So it's almost like um, I give you a dollar, you give me a dollar at the very same second. So I'm reaching for your dollar at the same time that you're reaching for my dollar. And then we take it at the same time. There is a split second when both of our hands are on both of the dollars. That's the idea of an activation complex. Okay, hard stuff. The Boltzmann distribution, it's actually the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. Um, this is actually carved on Boltzmann's tombstone, if you want to talk about it. He's so famous for this that his grave has this chemical equation on it. But in any case, he kind of he had this idea or studied the fact that at any temperature, let's say here's a low temperature, at any temperature, all the different molecules have certain amounts of energy. Some have a lot of energy, some have some, some energy, whatever, okay? Let's imagine a glass of water. At the very surface of that water, some of those molecules have enough energy to go into the gas stage. That's called evaporation. So you can set a glass of water on the desk, and after several days, the glass of water is half full and a quarter full, and it, it's, it dries away. Eventually, it, it goes into the air. So right at the surface, there's a, some of those that have enough to go in the air. Essentially, that's what boiling is. Boiling is getting that water into a gas phase or into a vapor phase. Well, so at any temperature, there's a little bit that's going to have enough kinetic energy to escape. So let's take two things that are slamming together. At any temperature, okay, let's say I've got a billion molecules and it's, you know, 100 degrees or or 20 degrees or 30 degrees or whatever you want to say every one of some of those molecules have enough energy to actually slam together and make a reaction okay even at a low temperature there's a tiny little bit if i raise the temperature this is what boltzmann found if i graph the temperature at say a low temperature and then i look here okay here's this is the activation energy this line i've got a little bit of percentage that's gonna have enough kinetic energy to make a reaction. But if I raise the temperature, okay, I raise the temperature to a higher temperature, I've got more. Do you see I've got a higher degree of those molecules that have enough energy to, to make a reaction. And that's why temperature is the measure of kinetic energy. So if I raise the temperature of something, I'm banging them together more frequently and I'm gonna get a higher reaction. Okay, or a more quick reaction. So the Boltzmann distribution simply means that as you increase the temperature, more percent, a higher percentage of those molecules have enough energy to slam into something and break bonds and form new bonds. And that's what we want when we have a reaction. And here's the ugly math. The fraction, which we have is just F, the fraction of molecules that can be found with enough energy to slam into another molecule and cause a reaction is uh, found through this expression, okay? E, which is a natural log of E. Uh, there's an E button on your calculator, believe it or not, okay? So there's an E button, you would, that's, it's, it's, a, it's a certain number, it's a fraction. Raised to the, okay, so this is to a power. This is a power. The power is a fraction. <laughs> this is so awful and ugly. This is ridiculous. I just feel like crying when I have to do these. But it's simply a number, E, which is on your calculator, raised to a power. And that power is the activation energy. That way you can actually find out what the activation energy of something is. If you know what the percentage of molecules that can do it, then I can figure out how what the reaction energy is, how much energy I need to put into it. So it's raised to the negative act, act, activation energy divided by R, remember the R is the rate con uh, is the gas constant, and there were two gas constants. There was, there was 0 0.0821, and then there was the 8.34, I think it was 341 uh, joules over moles uh, Kelvin. So this is gonna be that R, and then the T is in the Kelvin temperature. So if I know the temperature, and R is a constant, I can look it up on the internet, and the activation energy, then I know 
how much what the fraction of 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 molecules that have sufficient energy to form a reaction or conversely if i have the if i know the fraction i can figure out the energy that i need in order to cause a reaction either way those are very useful if i'm trying to get a, a reaction to go so let's say that that i have a chemical plant say i don't know charleston there's about five or six of them and i'm trying to do something that people are going to pay me for so i'm trying to make a lot of money well, I would love to know how much energy that I need to put into that so that I'm not wasting my time uh, boiling something that could happen at room temperature or whatever. I want to know how much energy it's going to take because it's almost like how much money is it going to take to do it. And that's what it is. If I have to heat something, I want to know how much that I can use so that I'm not wasting it. Another very useful equation is the Arrhenius equation. And the Arrhenius equation is a mathematical relationship between the rate constant, which is K. Remember, the bigger the K, the more likely it is to be products, okay? The bigger the K, and the activation energy. So the higher the activation energy, what this is showing me is that the higher the activation energy um, that I'm going to have, the lower the K will be. My rate constant gets lower and lower and lower, the more expensive it is to put that investment in. Let's say that if I have, if I put in a dollar, I get a dollar fifty. Well, I can do that. I've even got a dollar. So there, wow, I got a dollar fifty. But let's say if I put in a billion dollars, I get fifteen billion dollars back. Do you see it? I'll never get that money. Even though it's free money, I can get fourteen billion dollars for free. I still can't do it because I could never raise the billion. It's the same idea. If I increase the activation energy higher, 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 I somewhat is going to get too expensive for me. There might be some percentage of people in this world with enough money to do it, but I can't do it. It's the same idea. The rate, the, uh, the, the fact of the constant rate constant K is going to get lower as my activation energy E sub A gets higher. That's what this relationship is, okay? So the A is the frequency factor, which is uh, based on the F that we looked at in the previous slide, how much of the percentage is, is going to happen. And so essentially, they used, um, Arrhenius used the thing we've already found out, the Boltzmann distribution, to realize that the K and the activation energy can be related mathematically, and that's what he did. Okay, it looks like my slide went wonky. I've got here, the uh, this should be up here just a little bit, and this 1 over t should be in there. So we're going to see that, that if you were to take the natural log of the Arrhenius equation, you're going to get, a, you're gonna get a, a straight line, okay? A straight line, which we love straight lines when we're graphing things. So what we see is if you, if you plot the natural log of k, by 1 over the, the temperature, you're going to get a straight line. That means that there's the same mathematical relationship between every spot. Now, that's useful because if I can determine the temperature two or three places, then I know the rate constant. And the rate constant tells me how much product that I'm going to make. That's the useful thing. So I can figure out K... If, and I can then figure out the, the activation energy, if I, you can tell me the temperature at a couple places and I know the relationship between K and the, uh, and the activation energy. Now, again, this looks like jibberty jabber. It's just so complicated. It looks mathy and makes it give, have a headache. But once you do a few problems, you realize, oh, this is not so bad. I know what I'm doing. I can do this. That's why, we, that's why we do the lesson at night and we, do, we practice during the day so that we can practice. And as we practice, we get a handle on these things and they're not such brain busters. So may the Lord bless and keep you.